um, I took a look at the SS20 scenario. I think I've played it before, but and it's a one-turn scenario, but man, it's just a nightmare. Um, it's worrying just about all the air power. Let me find it again. Um, you just have tons and tons of planes. You have a couple of special forces units that can come in. What you've got is this IL-76 carrying an SS-20 on it. Um, the US's goal is to capture it <laughs> or destroy it. And really you're just going to be playing um, tons and tons of air missions. I don't want to do that. That is too much like uh, <laughs> the fleet games in Gulf Strike for my taste. Um, a, this game I'm into for more of the uh, more of the insurrection units and the operations on the ground. So then I start flipping through all the different scenarios, and this is what I do every damn time. <laughs> I play scenario two. I'm like, eh, that's lame. I don't do this bloody march, or maybe I do. It's not much of a scenario, really. Um, you can see very few units in it. Uh, so I might go back to that some of the times. I do the fall of Samosa. Maybe I'm disturbed by it and say, heh, should have done the 1979 scenario. This is just my history with this game. And then I start, I look at SS20. Maybe I try playing it, maybe I don't. It's a massive clusterfuck, though, in terms of... Uh, I forgot, there's Cuban and Soviet planes on there. It's just interceptions after interceptions. Great, if you want to do an air combat game, fine. But that's not what I signed up for. So then I start looking at the intermediate scenarios, and I'm like, oh, look, a conventional war scenario. Well, I just read the intervention rules for SS-20. That's not what I'm going to do. Um, and this is non-historical... Uh, Uh, you know, and these have multiple variants, so they have their setup rules that are complex. Contra Drive, uh, again, not a historical scenario, but a conventional game possible option that comes out of this. And I start looking through, and this is just what they all are. They're all these situations that could maybe happen, maybe don't happen. And I'm like, fuck it, man. I don't want to try to figure out which scenario I'm going to play. This one's always attractive to me, but it's 44 turns of conventional game. At least it's historical. Most of it is not. Uh, most of it's these hypotheticals. And then I just say, screw it. Um, maybe I want to do Paper Tiger, uh, which is the U.S. deciding a massive invasion. Eh, I don't know. And again, I think it has multiple different setup options, so I'm going to likely get confused. So then I just keep flipping through, flipping through, and I run into the scenario generation system, and I'm like, okay, let's just fucking do this. <laughs> so I am going to randomly generate a scenario, and this is just what happens, and... Um, report on that as I go through it. Uh, because, I mean, yes, I started my setup for this, pulled the units out, and I'm just like, I can't face this. I don't want to set up another one, especially since the setup systems are, yeah, the, the sequence, uh, not sequence, uh, the order of battles for the scenarios, there's a whole mess of them, and they're like split between the scenario page and elsewhere. Screw it. This, to me, was what the game ended up always being about, was let's play a scenario generation scenario. So I'll work my way through this, and we'll get one set up, and that'll probably be the last thing I do in this, and then I'll go to my uh, SpaceX X that I've got to do soon. Flavors of random scenario generation. One is you can play out where each player kind of picks what their doctrines are, and another is where you randomize it. I'm, of course, going to do the randomizing. Uh, I should probably be better off doing the pick your own, but uh, the problem with that is I just can't justify it. <laughs> I'm like always, let's see what happens. So, 
First, we do the doctrine. Each player rolls the die a number of times to determine the political super, uh, uh, structure of the superpower. The ally rolls first to determine the current uh, doctrine of the U.S. He rolls the die four times, once each for executive, legislative, military, and media. Okay, that's right. Probably aren't going to need this whole page, but... Yeah, great. There you go. Pen that doesn't work nicely. Executive. Uh, what else? I can't fucking remember. Legislative. Uh, military and media. To me, this is sort of the fun part of the game anyway. <laughs> Let's roll up what we get. So we look on the doctrine table and we roll a die for the executive branch. Well, it is either going to be dove or hawk. There's no moderate stance. We get a dove. That'll be a minus one. Let's see what that means. The legislative branch splits more evenly. Um, it can take a more centrist position. That is also dovish. Okay, we're going to have a pretty conventional game. Uh, how's the military feel? Well, the military is always pro-war. <laughs> Uh, unlikely, but whatever. Yeah, they're moderate, so they're a zero. Oh, come on, yellow press. No, not an option in this game. And the media is dovish. Okay, so we may end up seeing a strong uh, Soviet reaction. Of course, if I keep rolling dice the way I do, that's not going to work. Uh, okay, the legislative is particularly important because of War Powers Act and stuff like that. We'll see that. Uh, okay. After the Allied is done, the Soviets roll. Three times. Politburo. Yeah, they sound like a democracy here, don't they? Um, military and KGB. Not the one important person. You know. Although, me, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. The Politburo. The Politburo is a hawk. So we'll put a plus one there. Uh, the military. The military is moderate at zero. And uh, how does the KGB feel? The KGB is hawkish as well. Okay, so. We've got the U.S. unprepared. Uh, hey, Carter's second term? Uh, probably not. Carter was not at all that dovish. Um, so. E, but maybe a, a response to the Iran-Contras uh, situation and whatnot. Okay. After both players have rolled the dice, they add up the numbers for each faction. Uh, when each has combined numbers, they look at the doctrine schedule to look at the doctrine for each side. The doctrine schedule over here. So, the U.S. is at minus three. That's going to be non-intervention. And the Soviets are at plus two, which is going to be adventurism. <laughs> All righty. Uh, that's going to be interesting. I don't, I don't know if I've ever gotten that. I think I've always gotten like non-intervention versus Brezhnev, which felt weak, but okay. Uh, now what? Determine preparedness and intervention. The box on the doctrine matrix that was chosen gives one or more preparedness levels for the various things. Okay. Uh, why is this copied here? I don't know. Okay. Uh, not seeing this. Great. Uh huh. Okay. What are they talking about? Uh, the box on the doctrine matrix that it was chosen gives one or more preparedness levels. Uh, okay, we chose this box. Uh, 
Ah, it's over here, right? Okay, so we have um, Allied Non-Intervention to Adventurism. That's going to be box three. So the FSLN is 3 comma 4. What the fuck does that mean? I don't know. Okay, if only one number is given, that's the preparedness level, U.S. intervention level for the forces involved. If several numbers, the owning player must draw a chit to determine initial preparedness level. Okay, so we essentially roll the dice <laughs> because there's one of each chit. There's, uh, I don't know where they are. We got prep level chit somewhere, but they don't matter. Okay, so FSLN, odd or even. FSLN is going to be a 3. Uh, the Communists, 3 or 4. They will be a 4. Okay. The Allies, the Allies are only a 3, and that's Central American Allies. Uh, they're pretty heavily in it, but the U.S., has a zero. Now, what's the difference between zero and none? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Okay. Do, 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 do. The allied player places his in. If there's only one number, uh, the force does not need to draw a chip. No, it's a down. Initial world tensions. We add up the number of th the three preparedness level and the U.S. intervention level. That's going to be ten. Hmm. We look at the world tensions player table and roll a die. That's going to be here. Initial tensions will be at three. Now we need the world tensions marker, which I got to find in here. There it is. Hey, that was nice of me. And we put that at three. It's got a U.S. intervention of zero on it. Uh, I thought this was the U.S. intervention, but okay. All right. Um, I don't know how zero and none are different. <laughs> okay. Adjust preparedness U.S. intervention levels. Each player has the chance to adjust the level of his side's forces. The communist player can adjust either FSLN or communist preparedness. The allied player can adjust the allied preparedness or U.S. intervention level. A player can increase or decrease by one. The new level must be one of those listed in the initial box of the doctrine matrix. The adjustment must be to the next level up or down. You cannot skip a level. If a player... If either player or both increase a level, the world tensions marker is moved up a space. The marker cannot be moved down. Um, well, gosh. <laughs> we want to be more prepared. <laughs> what the hell? Um, why, why would you roll a die for this? Well, it would increase tensions. Uh, okay, is this done secretly or anything? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, even the U.S. is going to increase the allies? Yeah. And I guess anything but a 1, the FSLN will increase because we don't understand why we wouldn't increase it, but there might be something. Okay, so those both go up. So we move those up to 4s. And at least one player increased. And why did I do that? Because it doesn't say secret. So this goes up to there. Okay. Whatever. Um, determine a random event. Roll a die on the random events table. This is what starts, what triggers the, the, um, the, the conflict. And I don't know where it is. I've done this long, long ago. 
I know it exists. All right, well, I'm going to keep looking for it. This is over here. It's only optional, but it's required for this. All right, we get five Panama Canals closed. Okay. Wonder what that's going to mean. Determine victory objectives. The players refer to section 22.9, read the current world situation, and determine who will be the aggressor for the game. Victory objectives are given to each for each aggressor and defender. Note the U.S. becomes an aggressor only at U.S. intervention 4 when the first U.S. ground units enter Nicaragua. Uh, you wrote, write down uh, the goal level you'll try to achieve as an aggressor, minimum expansion or militant. The goal levels are based on the prep level. Note that the lower the preparedness level, the fewer objectives you have to win. You can never pick a lower goal level than your prep level allows. Uh -oh. Once players have selected their goal level, they reveal them to each other. Each player should also carefully read the objectives as a defender. I should have read this before I decided to up my preparedness. Um, but whatever. Uh, uh, each player, yeah. Nicaragua becomes a defender when the first U.S. ground unit enters a hex within Nicaragua at U.S. intervention level 4. Uh, it's recommended that they discuss the goal levels to make sure they explain, understand what they must accomplish as both aggressors and defenders. Both players receive their victory point markers. These markers are used to record victory points for FSLN and the U.S., Victory points for Femlin and FDN Arda are recorded on the victory point record. Yeah. Okay, 22.9. And yeah, I'm kind of going blind, as I always do. Oh, good God. <laughs> Each description of a world a condition listed below is accompanied by a list of goals that must be achieved for the victory. The aggressor for each scenario is listed, usually Nicaragua and the FDN Arda. If U.S. intervention begins or rises to level 4, the U.S. becomes an aggressor as soon as the U.S. enters a hex that is totally within Nicaragua. The goal levels for U.S. victory objectives then apply. If U.S. intervention begins at 4, they must also write down the goal level for U.S. as an aggressor. If U.S. intervention rises to 4, the Allied player simply announces their goal level. Each player has a victory point record in his charts and tables booklet in which to keep track of the objectives he controls or is captured. Uh, you should use pencils and erasers, since the points can change during the game. <sighs> Each aggressor is given three possible goal levels, minimum, expansionist, and militant. The goal level that a player selects is based upon the prep level of his units. For example, at box one, the communist may select any of the three goal levels. I don't know why. Jesus. Okay, we don't have goals here listed. I didn't think we did. Okay, great. Uh, any of the three goal levels of his FSLN begins at one, but he can only select expansionist or militant at two. Likewise, allied play. I don't understand. I just don't get it uh, at all. God, I hate this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing anything here that talks about it. Um, okay, so it's talking about stuff in this box, and I don't get it. Um, maybe it's talking about some other box. I don't know. You see why I don't want to play these games that <laughs> get, get thumbs, right? Uh, Alright. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. Well. Ah! Okay, so there's a whole list here. So we're in box three. Non-interventionist 
adventurism. While the U.S. seems to turn a blind eye to the deteriorating situation in Central America, Bo Moscow has opted for a less for direct military intervention in the area. The Soviet leadership makes a bold gamble to gain an ascendancy in Central America and to belittle American foreign policy, assuming that a quick war in the area can be won before U.S. military can respond in time. They have prepositioned considerably considerable jet aircraft in Cuba to ferry into Nicaragua and counter the ability of U.S. aircraft. The U.S. leadership is beginning to mobilize in threat of communist aggression, and should U.S. forces be forced to intervene, they hope to convince the American public of their wisdom. Nicaragua sees this as a golden opportunity to destroy the Contra threat while smashing the fascist military regimes in the area. Their goal is simple, to free the peoples of Central America. The FMLN will pro prove extremely useful in distracting the Salvadorian military, while the main Nicaraguan units drive on to conquer. Um, the Allies are prepared for war in the area and have reportedly have repeatedly focused world media attention on the FSLN buildup in hopes of getting the U.S. to respond quickly. They are prepared to fight delaying actions until the U.S. military might can help bring the balance in their favor. The communists are the aggressors, as are the FDN uh, ARDA. So, I must pick at least expansion or military. for my victory conditions. And what you'll see is I don't know what. <laughs> um, okay. God. I hate this shit. Maybe we'll play something else. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to play this game anymore. The, an aggressor does not have to meet all the objectives listed for a goal level to win the game. During any, any end of turn stage in which one player or the other has fulfilled one of the aggressor's listed victory conditions for a goal level, he can seek to end the game. An aggressor can continue to get others. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know. Uh, we'll go for expansion. Because we're allowed to go for it. And we'll do the same with FDN Art. Okay. Um... So what are our goals? Versus FDN Arda, it's destroy four entrenchments. Four entrenchments. Four entrenchments and eliminate and eliminate all regular and insurgents. Well, is that against it? That is versus one or the other. Okay. Two is versus the FSLN. Aren't we the FSLN? No, this is for the FSLN. 90 victory points in Central America. I don't know what that means. Okay. Three is against Femlin. Or for Femlin, I'm not sure. Capture 12 victory points in El Salvador. This is for Femlin. I can't remember who belongs to what. And if the U.S. gets into play, gaining 20 victory points against the U.S. Uh, is worth 20. I don't have to pick one of these. These are, these are my potential goals. I aim for all of them to get what I can. Uh, for these guys, for FDN or ARDA, and I may translate these over to my sheet of paper uh, if I can figure it out. Um, 
I am on an expansion because I pumped up to th to four. I shouldn't have done that. That's going to be uh, ten villages and airspace and two victory points. One airstrip. Well, we're going to play a longer game, I guess. If I can bear it. And two victory points. Okay. And two is 10 village, uh, I'm sorry, three other victory points. I don't know what that means. Three other than the 10 villages, one airstrip, and two victory points? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever it is, we're going to pause so I can close the door and keep shouting. I'm wondering if I have ever played this before. Uh, at the scenario generation. I may have played one of the uh, scenarios, not the Fall of Somoza probably, probably the, you know, the Nicara the El Salvador Civil War, the Nicaraguan one or something. I know I've played some fairly big scenarios on it, um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. And I played it a couple of times in the 90s where, you know, that's, that's where the games that I recorded on it were ones that I recorded by playing this um, after I created the game box where I started recording all my plays and now BGG lets me do that. Alright, I'll try to figure out what the fuck's going on. Depending on how many objectives you get, you claim a certain level of victory. Um, why would you go for the higher goals? I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, just getting one victory, one objective can get you the tactical victory. And you can decide, can you get more than one um, option there? What are your uh, possible victory uh, objectives? Well, destroying entrenchments and eliminating units, that's pretty easy to explain. And it's what it sounds like, more or less. Um, however, units could be being rebuilt or whatever and then they still count as destroyed until they show back up on the map. Uh, the 90 victory points for the FSLN in Central America. That is in allied countries. And because it says in Central America, I'm allowed to go into Costa Rica and Guatemala, as well as, assuming I'm allowed to, as well as Honduras and El Salvador. This is a massive, massive amount of points, though. <laughs> Uh, FMLN needs to get 12 victory points in El Salvador. That's a different uh, objective, which is here. Uh, if the FMLN is occupying towns or cities, I gain victory points. Um, I can't lose them, even if I'm knocked out of the hex or eliminated. Uh, I don't know. It looks to me like I gain the points for each turn that I'm in a town or a city. So that's pretty cool. So if the FMLN is just doing well, I'll get some good points there. Um, against the U.S., well, the way that works is I get points for eliminating U.S. Uh, air and ground units. Uh, and the number of victory points is based on the FSLN preparation level. I don't know what that means. Even if U.S. intervention drops lower, I can still get points for destroying them. I don't know where the schedule for that is, but I don't get any points until the U.S. intervenes. Uh, FDN and ARDA units are also eliminated if they're forced beyond where they can enter. And I think in this book we have some restrictions on that. Victory points for merchant shipping raids apply towards the total VP of communist players must gain in Central America. They don't count towards the El Salvador or Honduras specific ones. Conquest of an allied country does not necessarily end the game, but note that it does count as a decisive victory if you do manage to end the game while you've got an allied country conquered. Um, these are against U.S. points, the optional rule against shipping. Okay, now let's go to the FDN and ARDA points. They get points for villages, airstrips, and victory point hexes, as well as capturing victory point hexes. The allied player keeps track of the victory point wreckage of the villages they control. Now, here's the thing. The victory points are actually listed here. 
uh, for the different locations. Now, the U.S. losses, ah, the U.S. losses are here. So if I'm at prep level 4, which I am, I get uh, only times 2 and times 3 for air units. Okay. Um... If the U.S. comes in as an aggressor, uh, well, we're not really writing those down, so I'm not going to worry about them yet. At the beginning of the game, you get your victory point markers all in the zero. These are used to track FSLN and U.S. victory points. At the end of turn, the victory point should uh, mirror the total number of victory points controlled by the player at that time. So player gains victory point for capturing hexes, they should note down the victory point record, the game turn number on which the hex was captured. During the end turn stage, you add together the victory points you gained or lost in that turn and arrange the victory point markers. Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, see, that's not the FLM, FMLN, whatever. Uh, So I'm not sure. Those seem to be accumulation for just doing well. Uh, and this doesn't talk about that. This talks about permanent holdings. Once an allied country is conquered, its units are removed from play. How is it conquered? It doesn't tell you. <laughs> I suppose taking everything. Allied unit supply can be drawn from other things. Victory objectives for the defender. The defender has three goals. Minimum expansion and militant. Uh, well, I don't remember seeing any. What box were we on? We were on box three, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, box three has aggressors. Here are the defenders. Okay. I gotta keep these here, too. Uh, what are what are we aiming for there? Um, that's based on the prep level. Okay. So FDN Arda has to... Okay, I'll write these down, too. It is not a defender in this scenario until the U.S. comes in at intervention level 4. Right now they're at 0, so... <laughs> um, we went with the expansion level for uh, the defenders. FDN Arda, six regular ground units on the map. That sounds like uh, it's easy to tell, but we don't know when. I mean, hey, I won. <laughs> I'm still on the map. Turn one. Honduras, El Salvador, no more than 45 victory points to FSLN. And El Salvador, um, no more than five victory points to the FMLN. Let's see what the victory conditions there mean. Who knows? What are we, why are we counted as aggressors and defenders? I don't know. I don't think we are. I think, uh... I don't know. <laughs> it's supposed to be uh, the world condition for the thing. Uh, I, I don't know. I may be trying to piece things together. Um... Okay, I get the feeling the U.S. can't even enter if they're non-intervention um, versus non-intervention. I don't know. Well, what are we what are we talking about here? Why why is this under scenario generation if it's not? Uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I don't know what these victory conditions even mean because it, it looks to me like. We're both aggressors or defenders or not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's go back to the scenario generation system, which this is under, you know, um, and see what happens, what we have. Uh, the player should refer to that, read the current, and determine who will be the aggressors in the game. Okay, um, clearly to me, uh, the... Uh, the world situation says to me that our aggressors are um, 
the communists in this game. Okay. I don't know. Um, the U.S. does become an aggressor. Each aggressor and defender. I, I don't know what the fuck. Um, I don't know what they're talking about here. Each player should also carefully read objectives as defender Nicaragua becomes a defender when the first U.S. ground units enter. So I don't think I have to worry about um, the aggressive versions for FDN and Arda, but I'm not sure. Uh, both players leave their markers, prepare for play. Each player can serve blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. So I think we have chosen something about the victory conditions. I'm not sure. Um, so what about defensive victory conditions? Where, it, where were those talked about? What are we doing? Each defender has three goal levels. Yeah. Uh, the allies are given objectives for victory, which are also based on allied preparedness level, the lower the initial blah, blah, blah. The defender does not have to suggest select a goal level at the beginning of the play. As long as they meet all the objectives for a goal during an end of turn stage, they can ask his opponent if he wishes to end the game. If the opponent does not wish to end, the game continues. Uh, if it's impossible for the defender to meet all the objectives at one goal level, he must try to meet the objectives at a lower level. But he can never go to a lower level than one listed for the initial allied preparedness level, whatever. Uh, when, okay. Um, now we fling back to other rules because World War III and stuff, right? U.S. war powers, world tension. Okay. Uh... So we've got player selection of scenarios here for some reason, and we're in that. Uh, we're not going to deal with that. This is if you did not want um, to randomize what you get. Preparedness and U.S. intervention. FSLN preparedness. Uh, well, we're at four. That's complete mobilization of forces. Most things freely deployed. Oh, that sucks. Uh, no mobilization points. Extensive jet aircraft available. Insurgency forces available. Militia unit movement not restricted. Uh -huh. um, communist preparedness. There are four. Extensive Cuban ground units and a mechanized brigade in Nicaragua. Good, I don't have to worry about the rules of creating that. Plus Soviet participants. No restrictions on movement. All insurgency units available. Extensive Soviet Cuban uh, air reinforcements in Nicaragua. Great. Allied preparedness. Allies are at four. Uh, all units mobilized, most ground units available for free deployment, no limitation on allied movement or attacks. Salvadoran Honduran units can enter each other's territory and support each other uh, when attacking enemy units. Their air units cannot perform joint missions, however. Allies can enter all hexes in Nicaragua, maximum FDN and ARDA mobilization. Now, for the U.S., there's nothing. I'm at zero. It can go up. World tension. I wonder what that random event meant. It has effects, and I haven't gotten to it. The repercussions uh, of the conflict uh, are abstracted within the world tension table. The initial is determined by adding up the preparedness levels and looking on the chart. It can increase or decrease. Okay. First time, uh, okay, so we get these causes here that do things. Tegucigalpa uh, or San Salvador create an A. Cuban or Soviet air units involved in combat with U.S. Communist units using chemical weapons against allied ground units, not FDN or ARDA. Uh, communist regular units enter a hex totally with an allied country. Mm. Once for each country. The first time a communist regular unit exits the South Mappage. The first time a Cuban infantry is involved in combat with the U.S. The instant that the Cuban Mechanized Brigade appears on the map. That has already happened, I guess, probably. The moment the U.S. Congress makes a declaration of war, first time an allied ground unit captures Managua. Yeah, like the U.S. Congress declares war. Uh, the first time a U.S. ground unit enters a hex totally within Nicaragua. As soon as the allied player can captures either the FSLN government or treasury marker, 
Each time the Allied player voluntarily increases the U.S. intervention level before the World Trench Attack allows it to happen. It can be decreased, too. Forced withdrawal by U.S. Congress when the Allied player withdraws the last U.S. ground unit. Uh, for each voluntary decrease in U.S. intervention level by the Allied player when the Communist player announces that the Cuban mechanized brigade will be withdrawn, when the Communist player announces that all Cuban and Soviet units will be withdrawn, when the Communist regular ground units are withdrawn. Okay, and we got specifics on all that information. Each box on the track reflects the ability of the Allied player to raise the U.S. intervention level without affecting world tension. Boxes 0 through 6 have a 0, while world tension marker in one of those boxes, the Allied player must roll on the world tension increase table if he raises the intervention from 0 to 1, a B event, and there's going to be a table for this over here. And as you can see, the B events are not that nasty. Um, as long as the Allied player raises the U.S. level to a level allowed on the world tension, he doesn't have to brawl. He can freely re raise U.S. intervention one level per turn before the world tension uh, increase table allows him to. Each time he does so raise the level, he must roll on the table to determine if world tensions increases. During an end-of-turn phase, the Allied player can announce that he will raise U.S. intervention by one level, and if the new level is not freely permitted, he must roll a die on the B. This occurs after the initial U.S. intervention level to determine by the scenario generation. Uh, in the random scenario generation system, the Allied player can raise U.S. intervention or Allied preparedness by one. Uh, I don't think I was allowed to because I wasn't in my box. If he does so, world tension increases by one. He doesn't have to roll. The Allied player can also reduce U.S. intervention voluntarily. Uh, for each level reduced, that reduces things. U.S. war powers. The U.S. president has the ability to send U.S. troops to any trouble spot in the world at the end of 30 days. 15 turns, however, he needs a resolution from Congress. Uh, or a declaration of war. Congress may pressure the president to begin withdrawing U.S. military forces. During either scenario generation system, uh, the Allied player determines the leaning of the U.S. legislative branch, and that's why there's a separate die roll for it, um, because you might have a dovish Congress no matter what. Uh, the leaning of the U.S. Congress has a direct effect on the continuing presence. During the turn, the U.S. ground units first appear on the map. Uh, the Allied player places the war, war Powers marker on game turn track 15 turns ahead. He has 15 more turns to use the U.S. Uh, freely. During his end of turn stage, he must roll a die to see what Congress decides. Uh, they probably will not like us. <laughs> There's a War Powers Act table over here. We'd have a minus one for Dovish. There's a good chance that... Um, eventually, we're not going to go into declaration of war with the Dovish Congress. We might keep getting extensions of time, though, and it's fairly likely. So, you might want to do that. Of course, the executive is Dovish, too, so we might feel like we can only do it if we need to. Uh, voluntarily withdrawal of U.S. Unit, of units during any end of turn play, phase. Player can declare he's withdrawing his units. And there's specifics on how to. When the world tension marker reaches 15, general war breaks out between Warsaw Pact and NATO. By the way, there is a, a World War III scenario, which doesn't have a lot of U.S. intervention, or Soviet for that matter, because they're busy somewhere else. Um, reaching this box does not automatically end the game, however, although the Allied player may face severe restrictions if the game continues. Uh, once the world... War 3 starts, it starts. And you roll on a table with this, and Congress can impeach the president. Order immediate withdrawal, uh, restricting units. It's not going to be good for the U.S. to get to World War 3. And remember, the U.S. is the one who can kind of boost the tensions up. But by putting U.S. troops on the board, the communists can raise tensions too. And the communists appear to want tensions. Now, what happens with our particular uh, event here. 
Results on the random events table, we said the Panama Canal is closed. Okay, earthquake would be something. Coup d'etat. The Panama Canal has been attacked by communist insurgency units and is badly damaged. The Allied player cannot use the canal to transfer units from one side of the map to the other. No Colombian or U.S. units from the 193rd Infantry Brigade, Task Force Bayonet, or the Southern Command enter the game. Uh, now we find the preparedness levels and what troops are where. And since we're at preparedness four with everybody, we're going to have lots and lots of stuff on the board. And I'll start doing that. I'll show you the preparedness setup and maybe babble a little bit more. And then that'll probably be it for this video. Oh, this is the beginning of the random scenario. This is more or less the initial setup that's fixed for the Nicaraguans, and then I have these additional units. I thought I was missing a Nicaraguan unit. Uh, turned out it was left over from the last thing, which is weird because I vaguely remember thinking I was missing one before when I was at maximum prep uh, at an earlier game. Um, these are their reinforcements, which are just insurgency points and reorg points that they get over the course of the game. They only get points for the first 30 turns of the game. Now remember, I think this thing is like with no time limit, which means I may just bail like I did before. Um, notably, what do we got here? Uh, not all the units are in play. In particular, not all the air units. I had more of the air units in play for that SSN scenario. Um, obviously the CDSs don't belong. Uh, the anti-aircraft and SAMs, they're not here. Uh, the government and treasury, that's for a special scenario really. The SS are for the special scenarios. But a bunch of my regular infantry are not here. Now, they may be part of the mobilization rules here. I'm not sure. Yeah, you can turn 234s into 334s, etc. So I've already fully mobilized. Those units aren't in play. Um, uh, I have all these units to place. I'm a little confused about what they mean with deployed with level 1 air units. I, <laughs> No clue what they mean with, by that. Uh, I haven't seen anything about that. Uh, and I'll swap batteries and get to placing some more units. Basically, I'm going to have to actually put these down to support my victory condition attempts, but I don't know what they, that means right now. So I want to get everything that's fixed on the map before I start fucking around with stuff that's not. This is, I think, the complete setup. Wow. I thought I just swapped my batteries and, and apparently wasn't charging. Uh, this is the complete forces of the communists that are fixed. A couple of uh, insurgency stacks over there. They're on top of entrenchments, whatever. They're supply source. Uh, set up all the markers for them and a bunch of insurgency units there I'm using all the rules basically, including the options. I got a bunch of stuff here. Um, in addition to that, we've got the mechanized brigade, which will sneak in there if the U.S. comes in. It basically appears when that happens. So uh, we keep it hidden until the U.S. shows up, and it's forced by the rules. In terms of air units, there's a bunch of additional Soviet and Cuban air units that come in. They have to roll on a, a table um, for the first three turns. It's supposed to be 20 units over three turns, but the table only supports a maximum of 17, such as life. <laughs> I've set up the units as I wish to roll for them, the ones that I want to look at. Now it's time to set up uh, the preparedness level four allied forces. And because my batteries are kind of dying, this is a good time to take a little break break as late as it is <laughs> I wouldn't be coming back if I was taking a break so I finished setting up 
the Allied units that are in fixed positions. And we've got El Salvador, uh, Honduran, not much showing up there. Uh, some of the FDN here, but there's a bunch of stuff that's uh, variable setup um, that I'm allowed to place where I like. I also threw some counters down to indicate when I'm getting additional stuff. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. There, so both sides have mobilization points, but since we boosted our preparedness up to level four, for whatever cost that is, it prevented us from taking the most minimal victory conditions. Um, what that means is we're able to get, uh, um, we're already fully mobilized. Uh, that doesn't mean everything's on the board. Uh, like was said in the game uh, for the special events of the uh, Panama Canal, which seems to be what I get quite often. I got the earthquake once. I know I've played this sometimes with the intervention game. I don't know how far I got. <clears throat> Because it does drag down. Like, I've played some of the uh, intervention scenarios that are fixed scenarios. I know I've done it. And then I'll go to the this random one, and I'm like, ah, I'm playing the same damn game. <laughs> you know, This one may be a little bit more extensive because there's a lot of Soviet stuff, uh, a lot of communist stuff on the board um, to begin with. So it may be a little different from most of the scenarios that I usually play. I probably plink one of those off play the 30 or whatever turns that it takes and I'm like oh my gosh um, I like these because they're kind of open ended although there is sort of something screwed up because you don't keep getting points after some point so they do kind of peter out no matter what uh, most importantly wow look at all the insurrection forces that the allied forces have available to them um, I'm pretty sure that I'm missing CMA uh, a couple of CMA supply pieces. I don't know what the hell happened to them. They were the Allied supply sources that I was missing. The other thing, um, I'm going to just use perp walk uh, markers for that because I do remember there being black and white counters in this before, and I don't see them in any of the stuff that I have. So I'm assuming somehow I ate those. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing because everything else seems to be here. <laughs> but, okay, whatever. In fact, more than I need. Um, but yeah, there's nothing else that I have that could serve. Wait. You know, that's the U.S. Marine Corps support. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I've looked through everything that I could, unless they're on the back of the communist ones or something. I um, guess I should look at more than one since there's two of these. Yeah, I'm just assuming that I lost them. It's not that big a deal. Uh, although it depresses me, of course. Uh, will not start um, setting up these guys until tomorrow and it's going to take me quite some time to figure out hey how do I achieve my goals you know um, destroy four eaters entrenchments and eliminate all regular and insurgency units well I don't know how I'm going to be able to do that until I see where they set up but whatever uh, Femlin has a, I think these are points you have to be holding them all at the same time. I'm going to keep looking at that rule and try to figure it out, but I don't think that they're like, you temporarily hold it and you get points. But I think that you don't lose the points ever, which means you record them down, and if you ever captured them, that's good enough. Uh, not versus the U.S., anything there. Um... So this is kind of the big one that I'm looking at, is 90 victory points in, throughout Central America. Uh, Task Force Vietnam, uh, if I'm right, that is actually got a unit on the board. Remember that it, it doesn't come into the game, but that one unit is excluded, so I've got one unit uh, set up there. Honduras has some fixed anti-aircraft. Uh, Nicaragua does not. That's life. I don't know. <laughs> the 
no idea how I'm going to figure this out. And the U.S. intervention level, so at level one, which I can boost up to right away at some cost, I can start getting some planes. That's a big deal. Um, I think I want to do that as soon as possible because this is a nasty situation. Sending the Air Force in makes sense. Intervention 2 <coughs> starts getting me more planes. Uh, I think this may be putting a carrier group into play or whatever. Again, within reason. Doesn't look like I'm putting any troops on the board. I really don't want to get to where I'm putting troops on the board. That's that's the real issue here. Um, and that looks like that happens at intervention level three where I'm sending the Marines in. And I don't trust that the War Powers Act is going to help. But I think we're going to see a lot of air power thrown into this game because I am going to boost the U.S. intervention uh, up there. Remember, the U.S. does not want to get World War III. The communists don't care about that, even though they will lose the game of NATO <laughs> if I set that sucker up. All right. Dealing with freestyle setup. <laughs> it's just painful. You know, I'm trying to figure out Hey, what are my goals for this scenario? It's a complex um, situation to do so. I don't remember how much free setup there are in the other big scenarios, other than the generated ones. Um, I think there's fairly, I think there's still fairly heavy on it. So I'm focusing mainly on an invasion of Honduras because I'm not next to El Salvador. I'd rather meet up on them, but, uh, and it causes tensions to rise for each country I invade. I might also plug into Costa Rica. I don't have a lot of force down there, but whatever. And once I made that decision, it was fairly easy to place my pieces for the invasion, but I gotta worry about defenses too. So, you know, um, I've got a couple of units down here at, uh, at the airport, Punta Huete. Uh, then the air units becomes a big problem. Now I have to be in at least two air fields or whatever. <coughs> Quite honestly, airstrips aren't worth it unless you absolutely need them. Um, I was looking at like a Steli or something like that, but the ranges of the planes, even my short range planes are 14 hexes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. They're going to get me pretty far into Honduras. And maybe I can capture an airport or something if I get into Honduras and rebuild it or whatever. Uh, to focus there but there are advantages to being in multiple places at once in multiple bases at the same time if they're within EW range of each other and speaking of which each of these air groups actually has an EW with it right now so I should flip them over to indicate that uh, I ended up putting three that are within close range of each other that allows me uh, to accumulate them. Beyond that, I've also got uh, uh, the Messiah Air uh, EW capabilities, this big border out here, which captures all of them. But that can be suppressed, so I'd rather not. Uh, I'd rather not just count on that, uh, no matter what. So I created three air groups. The reason for um, making more than one air group is if I want to make a massive air mission. Um, I can only send, what, six planes from Puente to Huete at once and four from each airport. So I can get a 14-plane uh, attack. And I have never seen anything like that except off the carriers. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, even from the carriers, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You, you have to have some target you just really, really need to strike. Um, and without anti-aircraft and SAMs for the... Uh, There's basically almost no anti-aircraft for the uh, Sandinistas. I don't even think the carriers are going to want to do alpha strikes, but well, I don't know. Um, so that's what I've got set up so far. And now I take a big break and move on to the Allied setups. Uh, am I doing them in the right order? I don't know. <laughs> I can't find something that tells you the order you should do your setups in. Uh, 
So I'm doing it in the order uh, that they're declared in the scenario, which in a sense makes maybe sense, but it may also be the communists are always set up first uh, just because they always move first or whatever. Uh, I'm just going to scratch my head and say I can't tell you the answer to any of this. Um, I started looking at victory points. So remember, I had the little tips for my victory points. But man, it's just impossible. It's like everything in every country I want to invade is worth something. So I'm just going to have to, you know, I took something. Let's see if it's something interesting. Um, I mean, we're down to, okay, villages don't appear to be. But towns, supply sources, airports, ports, just, just so many different things that are worth victory points that I'm not going to worry too much about them, which pleases me, um, but I am going to keep the total running and write them down on there. i got to get a pencil and erase it and a decent eraser for that um, in order to, uh, you know, have an idea of where I am. And then I double check if I think I can declare a win. Now, of course, the allies can declare a win on turn one, um, but they can ask for a win and they're not going to get it, right? Uh, how the defender gets a win, yeah, I don't know. Um, <coughs> pretty much by the attacker saying, yeah, I give up. So I uh, find a counter that was out of place. Um, oops. Yeah, one of the problems with not backing your pipe too tightly when you're playing on paper. Uh, I have burned through a couple of them. <laughs> so, one of the things I realized is I, I, I stumbled around, as I tend to, trying to explain the cursing and complaining. Uh, the reason why I ended up settling on the choose your own scenario. <laughs> you know? Basically, when faced with a fistful of um, hypothetical scenarios, uh, how do you choose between them? I'm not, you know, I, I really don't have the time or the energy for this game to play more than one of these kind of larger scenarios. Um, not anymore in my life. In fact, I don't think I've ever made it through all of them. Uh, I tended to try to do that more way back when I was younger. And again, you know, so like I've made it through, I think, all the Imperium Romanum scenarios, which I feel this is kind of similar to me, a game that I'm not all that thrilled with, honestly, <laughs> that like has a tremendous amount of replay value. And it's like, well, that's just fantastic. <laughs> too bad, too bad designs that I really love don't have that, you know? <laughs> Eh, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I mean, the CWB games, I never play the variants. I always play the historical. I always tell myself, someday I'll play the variant, you know, see how something different could have changed things. No, doesn't happen. <laughs> Just not interested. Uh, <laughs> and especially now, now I have, have so many, many different games and, and that... I need to get videoed, among other things. Uh, but in this particular one, you know, these are fairly large scenarios, even when they're fixed turn, uh, they do potentially go on for quite a long time. Uh, I would expect a couple weeks, you know, of me playing to get through one of these. Um, and. I may not make it that far. <laughs> I just may not. I've put enough into this uh, that I know that yeah, I'm actually lowering my rating. It, it's just just not that interesting to me. Um, and not that good. I mean, it's not really handling the insurgencies well. Um, it, it's handling a very military side uh, of the aspect. Something like Vietnam actually handles what the insurgency means better than this does. Uh, this is just, you got some points and they come into you. Uh, the the Somoza one with destroying the units, giving you additional resources is kind of interesting. But I mean, the real the real case uh, in, in 
um, counterinsurgency and the insurgency itself is the management of your resources um, and denying the capability uh, to bring overwhelming force everywhere to the counterinsurgency forces and um, trying to prevent the insurgency from developing the resources that it needs uh, you know, to, to continue operating and, and to grow. Well, this game has nothing like that. This game is slices of, you know, I don't know what the scale is, but I'm guessing the turns are like a day. <laughs> Given that you can fly one air mission with each plane group, and they probably by, may even be smaller than that, uh, but night bombardment comes once per turn, so, you know, let's call it a day. Uh, but yeah, I, when faced with this large slew of things that didn't historically happen, which one do you want to play out? Well, randomizing it seems very appealing to me uh, for whatever reason. And that gives me more differences without having to pick particular scenarios that I think are appealing. Uh, obviously, that can come up with widely, you know, yeah, it could come up with a scenario that you don't want to play because it's boring. Uh, this one has more intervention than most, though, so at least I assume it will. Um, and this high preparedness. Um, I wanted to give this before, but I'll give it now, whatever, or later in, in the sequence. What we've got is a situation where... Um, some kind of communist operations are going on. They've closed down the Panama Canal, and there's been enough time while that is starting to happen, while the insurrections in Panama are going on, for buildup and preparation by all the regular militaries um, in play. Now, the insurgency forces are not really um, bigger than they ever are. They're, they're always kind of the same in all the scenarios. So uh, that, that's what we're going to see. I am working my way through. You know, we got El Salvador and Honduras down and uh, Costa Rica. And now we're at kind of the complicated stuff, which is what the FDN, I think this is, I can't remember the names, and Arda. And these have very loose placement restrictions and I'm not really sure. I'm having some trouble. Like, I'm thinking, you know, uh, so Arda is allowed to place anywhere in Nicaragua to the east of the 2600 row, so going down here. And I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, look, I can grab Bluefields. And I was a little worried about that, actually, and now I'm like, well, maybe I need to reposition my Nicaraguans um, to prevent certain key locations from being taken. Uh, and then I've got like these guys uh, who are not in supply at all. And I don't think can be there. Let's just move them to Bluefields. <laughs> Bluefields is a supply source. I don't want, um, I don't want this thing here. Uh, but that takes away now where I would have put Arda probably. I don't really want to be in the Messiah range. Um, but I'm like, is it better for me to be on a road or something like that uh, with the airstrip? Uh, or am I too exposed there? What are my goals for this scenario? It's not like, you know, it's kind of weird because the entrenchment presumably has been there for quite some time. And, well, gosh, you know, <laughs> this powder keg shouldn't be, and not that that should really interfere with it, but it seems a little odd in the in the scenario build up that it should just be somewhere at random part of me wants to look at other scenarios and see where the hell does it go there uh even harder for me is the fdn one now there are no insurgency units either on the board yet those haven't been placed yet uh it's a quiet time i guess i don't know where insurgents aren't really being used um we got insurgency units on the board in el salvador of course but you know, I mean, a regular operational uh, guerrilla forces, how long would that stay there, you know, on a road? And does this moment, does it justify bringing it into play? Do I want to put it somewhere where it can supply the mesquite units? Because they got a problem if I don't. Uh, what 
well, no, I can't. The Arctic, I don't think FDN and Arctic can cooperate. Um, but I'd have to look that up, you know? <laughs> so, like, just setting up the scenario and getting it ready. And it's like, yeah, okay, maybe if I'd played another scenario, I would understand the FDN Arda relationship better and a number of other things. But, man, I would have to go through uh, some of the factors with that, too. So, I just, you know, I hate, I hate free setup. This is one of the things. But, we were we were talking about the situation or something. Yeah, I don't know. I just get uh, I get sidetracked so so far. But that's why I I haven't been able to set it up. Is this well now? Okay, I was able to force my way through the conventional forces setup, but setting up um, uh, the rebellious forces is a little harder because. Uh, I don't want them just wiped out. That's victory conditions um, and could end the game. And I don't want them to be useless. <laughs> and I'm not really sure how much danger I'm in if I set up here, for example, or if I had set up in Blue Fields or Rama. What's up with that? I don't know. I outnumber the forces that'll be down there, so uh, maybe placing that in blue fields is a dumb idea. I don't know. God. <laughs> Do I have another unit? I mean, what's this guy doing? Why is he there? I don't know. Um, you know, I was more worried about the conventional stuff, didn't really think about how, how much the insurrection is going to affect me. Yep. I can say is the victory conditions for um, the FSLN in terms of if they want to meet the FDN Arda conditions. It's to destroy all four entrenchments that they have and all their units. Well, <laughs> that's going to be pretty damn hard. I just have to kind of protect one and put it someplace painful to get to, like up in these jungles, the jungle mountains in Honduras. And that's going to be really a hard thing to go for if I'm also dealing with the conventional forces. So I'm probably, and then here's the other side of it. These guys have to be a pain in the ass to the FSLN as much as they can. So, um, leave Rama open? Cool. Um, the problem with it is, I don't want my entrenchment there. My entrenchment should be kind of harder to reach, but my entrenchment's my supply source, and that's how I'm going to engage and cause problems. Now, those problems are not going to get me to Managua. That's a guarantee. Um, and that means, and, and then if I look at, you know, well, if the game's ending, what can I offer a victory on? I have to have all four of these, and with the FDN Arda, it's keep six units. Um, and with the others, it's to prevent a lot of victory points. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like, if I don't put them on a road, they are not going to provide much in the way of supply. If I put them on the road, um, they're eminently vulnerable. Put them on a road. <laughs> If I can wipe out the insurgencies, it gets rid of an annoying factor in the game, right? The one that I can't cope with? I don't know, maybe. I look at this and I say, you know, art is just not that big. They're not going to be able to do much of anything to anybody. <laughs> God. They might be able to help U.S. forces land. Um, beyond that, there's nothing they can really do on the victory conditions. I mean, this 90 victory points in Central America, that's not Nicaragua. <laughs> Since I'm not on the offensive... I just kind of want to stay alive. Um, right? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> ah, God damn. I made my damn decision finally on Arda. I still have the FDN to think about, which is going to be equally painful. Um, they got more entrenchments. I can, like, put one back protected and use the others to be more offensive. Um, I am not going to be on, on the road. Um, so here's a couple of interesting factors. Still debating the optional supply rules. I want to use all of them except maybe. I'm still thinking about the maybe here. Uh, the 
movement point trace one. Why? Because the movement point trace one is just too painful to operate with. So let's take a look. The movement point trace one is 12 infantry movement points back to a supply source. So if I wanted this, it's two, four, five, six. Okay, so he's in supply, that's great and wonderful. Um, four hexes back to a road or trail, and then being able uh, to get supplies through the road or trail, that indicates a level of logistic supplies that is not really present in Central America. And that's the reason why um, they don't, they disallow that, and maybe why there's so many different supply sources. But it's a fucking pain to do all these traces, you know, when you're counting actual movement points. And the question is, how much do you want the game to be about supplies? And how much do you want it to be about bringing military forces to bear? And I don't know the answer. Um, certainly, I'm set up with this concept of, oh, I want to use all these roadways for supplies. Whereas, yeah, I mean, with an LSU, I can do all kind of crappy stuff. But let's say it's here. One... Uh, Let's say we're looking here. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I could get to there, and that's it. And now, so I can't use this unit. So is it worth defending being there? I can throw the enemy out of there if that's of importance, which it isn't in this scenario. Why am I there otherwise? I don't know. That would be a useful unit to pull out if if I'm playing with the uh, fully optional supply rules. But within the supply, the optional supply rules, that's not that particular piece. And the way they're ordered, you know, geez, it's hard to tell, can you, you know, so there's optional supply rules, but there's multiple different ones, right? It's not a single optional rule. And I'm definitely playing with these two, the additional communist supply rules and Swan Island. Swan Island is important because it lets me supply to this village here uh, with the Mesquite Indians. Otherwise, they're kind of just garbage, right? Um, yes, they can limp their way towards an entrenchment or whatever, but they serve absolutely no purpose, you know, where they are. Not that the insurgency against Nicaragua serves much purpose. Its only reason is to cause problems during this offensive. Uh, it doesn't gain me victory points. I'm not going to be able to get anywhere with it. The only thing the Allies can do, the only thing the Allies want to do, is preserve all of their insurgency um, forces. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> some quantity of them. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of tossing around. Do I want that 12 movement point thing? Um, here's the problem. So with the additional communist supply sources, it does kind of work because I could build a supply source in Honduras or something for me to launch my attack on El Salvador. Otherwise, though, I just have to control the road networks and that's just so much easier to cope with. Uh, all right, on to the FDN, I guess. I don't know. God, I'm not looking forward to this. <laughs> okay, and I finished up my setup with the FDN uh, kind of ranging through here. Uh, and what else do we have here? I don't know why we have that transport helicopter there. Uh, the CIA and CMA are combined up here. This can allow me to transport additional supplies into Nicaragua, if I so desire. Uh, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, and I don't think that's going to be a necessary or useful factor. I think mainly the FDN is going to be helping protect eastern Honduras. Arda is going to be trying to cause some chaos. That's about it. Um, I said I had some special forces. I got Mossad there, and I've got some CMA uh, special forces down here. Um, bunch of yahoos with guns playing soldier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the Blackwater type stuff, right? You know, it wasn't it wasn't as big a deal back then. Uh, it was more shocking that the U.S. had mercenary forces. Uh, deployed anywhere in the world. Boy, we used to 
kind of think we'd use the military for stuff. And the only reason we used uh, the CMA was to get around uh, congressional restrictions. <laughs> Uh, if you if you had like um, a different political situation than the one that this scheme represents, with uh, actually this one's kind of unbelievable. So uh, the executive branch that's dovish probably wouldn't have CIA and CMA uh, as uh, embedded in here. So there's kind of a hey the political uh, factors don't really apply to. Um, they don't really apply very hard, you know. You're still trying to do the same kind of shit. <laughs> uh, I cannot. I, I have a hard time imagining a truly dovish president being in favor of inserting mercenary forces and CIA um, and heavy uh, support for these insurrectionist forces in Nicaragua. I I, I just don't see it. Um, so, you know, the band of what is dovish and what is not, uh, because these are executive branch decisions. These are things that, especially with the CMA, were of questionable legality at the time. Uh, they were basically trying to get around congressional restrictions to prevent um, U.S. support for the Contras. Well, if you're doing that... <laughs> Uh, why are you doing that if you're dovish, right? You know, uh, it just feels a little weird to me. And it feels like the price that should be paid for a dovish response would actually probably, I mean, if Congress and, and the executive branch are both dovish, and the media is dovish, you know, everything is on this, right? That's that's what we the, only the military is not. Well, the military has a certain um, oh momentum. Um, it's going to be hard to undo certain Pentagon things, so there probably would still be engagement here. The CIA again, a certain momentum. It might be hard to pull the CIA out, even if you just had a dovish president. You know. It might take more than one term uh, to manage that. The CMA, though, man, that was just, that was shoestring stuff. And that could have been cut off so quickly by anyone who's aware of it. So uh, somebody <laughs> is not as dovish as they claim to be. Um, yeah. And, uh, well... I guess we're about ready. The only thing I have left to do to prepare that I can think of is I have to go up to the loft and give myself a pencil and an eraser so that I can keep track of the Victory Point uh, situation as it develops. And then we're ready to actually start the game. Um, yes, this is a lot of video for setting up a game, but I gotta tell you, setting up the game is half the battle to getting it started, right? <laughs> At this point, yeah, it's pretty big. All right, I'm going to load this one up, and then we'll kick it off.